At, at this hearing, we're gonna discuss policing in America and whether the doctrine of qualified immunity should remain intact. For anybody who's not aware, there are some people who watch these proceedings at home, qualified immunity is the doctrine that protects law enforcement officers from civil liability for honest mistakes they make while serving in one of the most high pressure jobs in the world. The vast majority of police officers in this country are self-sacrificing public servants. They put their lives at risk every single day when they put on that badge. I know this from my own experience. I grew up at the Fire and Police Training Academy in my hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, where my dad was a training officer and assistant chief before he was critically injured and permanently disabled in the line of duty. Um, if we're gonna ask our officers to potentially make the ultimate sacrifice for the safety of others, we have to provide them with legal protections that qualified immunity affords, period, full stop. However, despite the sacrificial service and bravery of law enforcement, there are some Democrats in Congress who continue to push the false and outrageous narrative that police are actually somehow to be regarded as the enemy. We all saw this over the last couple of years, and as we all know, there are some on the progressive left, some elected members of Congress who've gone as far as to call for the full-scale abolition of police, if you can imagine that. It, it's, it's insanity. My Republican colleagues and I are here to tell you that they are wrong, stating the obvious. We need police officers and we must maintain law and order. Nothing makes this more apparent than the spike in violent crime and homicide that we've seen in Democrat-led cities that have defunded their police departments. In 2021, the homicide rate rose by 5% from the previous year. And if you think that number is unacceptable, wait till you hear the next one. In 2020, the homicide rate rose by 29% over the previous year. Yet even in the face of this madness, police officers wake up every single day, they kiss their loved ones goodbye and they show up for work. Meanwhile, the defund the police movement, the pandemic and COVID vaccine mandates have gutted police recruitment and retention efforts across the country. I know many of you have experienced that. At a time when departments are struggling just to fill open positions and make our community safer, we still have Democrats here determined to expose our officers to civil liability for simply doing their jobs. They, there are very real common sense reforms that all of us acknowledge that we can make to policing in America. We've had thoughtful discussion about that. That's why I joined a large majority of my Republican colleagues in supporting the Justice Act, this, this last Congress. But the Democrats in charge made sure that that bill was dead on arrival. They squandered what we saw as a crucial opportunity to make positive change and build better relationships in our increasingly divided communities. And this just shows the, the radical left's calls for reform are nothing more than political talking points, sadly. So what should we be talking about today instead of eliminating qualified immunity? We should discuss ways that we can further support our police officers. We should encourage them to continue building stronger relationships with their communities. We should give law enforcement the tools and training they need to maintain law and order. Their role is critical. This is a critical part of the fabric of our nation, and as we all know, that fabric is being frayed right now in unprecedented ways. We are the greatest nation in the history of the world, and the only way that we will continue that, maintain that, is if we back the blue. It really is that simple to us, and qualified immunity is a big part of this. So I look forward to the discussion today and hearing from our witnesses. I know some of you have done some very important work in this arena, and I yield back. Thank you. Before I recognize Mr. Nadler, I'm just going to take a little privilege as a chair. I cringe, Mr. Johnson, when our members talk about defunding the police. I was a police legal advisor, worked in the police department in Memphis for three and a half years. And my cringes are no different than your cringes when your members suggest that members of Congress, and particularly on your side, the implied suggestion is, are engaged in sex orgies and cocaine doing. So we got them on both sides. Mr. Nadler, you're recognized. You haven't been in any orgies lately, have you? Not lately. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course we need the police, and of course we need the police to do their jobs, and of course we need the police to do their jobs legally. And that's what we're here to talk about today. More than a century and a half ago, Congress passed one of the earliest civil rights laws in our nation's history the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Section one of that law, now codified at 42 U.S.C. section 1983, empowers individuals to, to sue state and local government officials who violate their federal rights under color of state law. This private right of action is a critical means of holding government 
officials accountable. To fully appreciate Congress's intent in passing the statute, we must understand the historical backdrop against which it created Section 1983's right to sue. Section 1983 originated from the unwillingness of state officials to protect and enforce the constitutional rights of African Americans after the Civil War. During this period, the Ku Klux Klan and its allies used racial violence and terror to undo the gains of Reconstruction. Under the cover of darkness and cloaked in hoods to conceal their identity, Klan members roamed the South with impunity, mutilating and murdering African Americans in bloody massacres. This barbarity often went unpunished, as former Confederate states did little to stop the violence. In fact, law enforcement frequently took part in the acts themselves. The complicity of these local governments left victims with no recourse until Congress responded with Section 1983. In drafting the statute, Congress sought accountability from state and local officials by ar arming victims of state-sponsored abuse with a federal court remedy. Unfortunately, the accountability that Congress sought to achieve remains largely unrealized. This is in large part because of court decisions applying and expanding legal precedents for defendants through the doctrine of qualified immunity, which shields state and local officials from liability unless they violate, quote, clearly established, unquote, law. Notably, the text of Section 1983 says nothing about qualified immunity, nor is it written in the Constitution. The doctrine is purely a creation of the Supreme Court. As we will hear from some of our witnesses today, this standard imposes a substantial obstacle to recovery for people whose civil rights have been violated. Since the Supreme Court first announced the current qualified immunity standard, it has found that a government official violated clearly established law in only three instances. This number says it all. As constitutional scholar and litigator David Gans aptly stated, the Supreme Court, quote, converted a statute designed to open the courthouse doors to those aggrieved by official abuse of power into a statute that bolts the courthouse doors firmly shut, immunizing wrongdoers rather than holding them accountable, close quote. Indeed, qualified immunity subverts the very purpose of Section 1983 and denies justice to victims of state-sponsored abuse. We have seen how the doctrine has absolved police officers of the most egregious conduct. We have witnessed black and brown lives be devalued as certain officers act with impunity. This is precisely why I joined Congresswoman Karen Bass in introducing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which would, among other things, eliminate the defense of qualified immunity for federal, state, and local law enforcement officers. As Chief Justice John Marshall noted, we are a nation that has been emphatically termed a government of laws and not of men. He also warned, however, that we, quote, will certainly cease to deserve this high appellation if the laws furnish no remedy for the violation of a vested legal right, close quote. If we are to heed this warning, state and local government officials who infringe on the constitutional rights of their citizens must be held accountable. But the doctrine of qualified immunity currently stands in the way. It is imperative, therefore, that we address this issue so that all Americans can enjoy equal protection of the laws as Congress intended in 1871. I want to welcome our witnesses. I look forward to their testimony on this important topic, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. Um, Mr. Jordan's not present, and I don't think he was going to give a statement. So we proceed with our witnesses, and I thank each of you for participating in today's hearing, both virtual and in person. I introduce each witness after, uh, and after the introduction, we'll recognize him or her for their oral testimony. Got a little, those are present here, there's red light says you're finished, green light says you're on, yellow light says you got a minute, get it together. Um, um, your statements be, that you have will be entered in the record in their entirety, and you got five minutes. Help you stay within that time, you've got your lights. For witnesses testifying remotely, there's a timer in the Zoom view that should be visible somewhere in your screen. I think you have to do the char character that allows you to see everybody, and then you've got something up there on the right-hand side. Uh, before proceeding with testimony, remind all your witnesses that uh, if you say anything that's not true, Bueller will push the buzzer and you know, you'll be subject possibly to penalties under 
law, section 1001, title 18. Our first witness is the Honorable John Newman, who is uh, coming to us through the miracle of Zoom. Judge Newman serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. He was appointed to the Second Circuit in 1979, served as his chief judge from 1993 to 1997, and assumed senior status in 1997. He previously was a district court judge for the District of Connecticut, the home of Rosa DeLauro and others. He was appointed to that position in 1971. From 1964 to 69, Judge Newman served as United States Attorney for the District of Connecticut, and I guess he's cheering for Connecticut in the basketball game, the women tomorrow night. I will be too. Prior to that, he worked for Senator Abraham Ribicoff of Connecticut, a great United States Senator. He was his administrative assistant, and he worked for Mr. Ribicoff at HEW, where he was a secretary. And then before that, he was governor of Connecticut. Judge Newman served as a senior law clerk to Chief Justice Earl Warren of the United States Supreme Court, was a law clerk of Judge George T. Washington of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, served in the U.S. Army Reserve from 1954 to 62. Uh, and I presume he got to know Toby Moffat, who was a congressman back in the day from Connecticut. Judge Newman received his LLB from Yale Law School and his BA from Princeton University. Not shabby. Judge Newman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Nadler, uh, Chairman of the Subcommittee Cohen, Vice Chair Ross, and Ranking Member Johnson. I appreciate the uh, subcommittee's invitation to testify on a topic that has interested me ever since I started writing about it 44 years ago. As a district judge, I became familiar with the topic, uh, having conducted 30 uh, police misconduct trials under uh, Section 1983. Uh, as a matter of fact, I testified on this topic before this very committee 30 years ago uh, on, uh, at the invitation of then Chairman Don uh, Edwards. Uh, I understand your topic today focuses primarily on qualified immunity. I have two suggestions to make to the committee, which perhaps anticipate what you're going to deal with in the future. But with your permission, I will present them today because I think they have a distinct bearing and relationship to the qualified immunity issue. The two proposals are one, to establish employer liability for the constitutional violation by an employee. The second is to permit the United States to bring suit on behalf of a victim whenever there is a constitutional violation by a municipal employee. Uh, first, as to employer liability, cities today are liable for the torts of all of their employees, with one notable exception. For example, if the driver of a garbage truck enters a pedestrian, the city is liable. The city is the defendant. The city is liable. And if there's a recovery, the city pays. Ironically, the only tort for which a city is not liable is the constitutional violation of a victim's rights. That seems to me a very odd set, uh, set of circumstances. Now, I understand there's the Monell case, which says a city can be liable, but as everyone understands who's familiar with it, that's a very limited doctrine. There has to be proof of a policy of promoting misconduct and plaintiffs uh, hardly ever uh, succeed in that. I also understand there's an indemnity in many cities, either by labor contract or by state law or by custom. But the indemnity is not a substitute for holding the city liable for this reason. In the first place, in the trials I ran, the city, uh, uh, there was indemnity. If there ever was a recovery by the uh, victim, the city paid it, but the jury didn't know that. And the, defend and the city was not a defendant in the courtroom. Uh, so the jury was often reluctant to impose liability on a police officer, unaware that the city, in fact, would pay. Uh, now, if you create city uh, employer liability, municipal liability, as we do for all other torts, it would have a profound effect on the conduct of police misconduct trials. Number one, you wouldn't even need qualified immunity because the victim would sue the city. There'd be no point in suing the police officer. In fact, if you establish employer liability, you don't even need liability of the police officer. You could do it the way the federal government does it for Tort Claims Act. Uh, if you sue an employee, if an employee of the federal government commits a tort, the U.S. government comes in as the defendant. 
There's no suit against the uh, employee at all. You could do the same with police officers. Let me turn quickly in my remaining time to letting the U.S. sue. Right now, the, the, the plaintiff is the victim, often somebody with one or two felony convictions, not the most attractive plaintiff in a suit. You ought to consider letting the United States sue to remedy the misconduct by, an, by a police officer or any other public official. There's plenty of precedent for that. The United States can sue to remedy violations of voting rights, public, uh, public accommodation rights, um, employment rights. There's no reason at all not to authorize the United States to come in and be the uh, proponent of a lawsuit where the allegation is that the Constitution of the United States was violated. The 1983 remedy, if strengthened properly, should accomplish three purposes. It should deter misconduct, it should compensate the victim, and it should, through the voice of the jury, condemn the misconduct. By creating municipal liability and letting the U.S. sue, you can diffuse the whole controversy over qualified immunity, you can eliminate it if you wish. You can even eliminate the viability of the police officer. And the net result would be a far stronger 1983 remedy for the violation of constitutional rights. I look forward to answering your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Newman, for your testimony and for your very distinguished service to our country. Uh, our next witness is Alexander Rein Reinert. He's the Max Freund Professor of Litigation and Advocacy and Director the Center of Rights and Justice at the Benjamin Cardoza School of Law at Yeshiva University. He teaches and conducts research in the areas of civil procedure, con law, criminal law, federal courts, and the law of prisons and jails. He argued before the Supreme Court in Ashcroft versus Iqbal and has appeared on behalf of parties in amicus curiae and many significant civil rights cases. Prior to his academic career, he was in the private practice of law focusing on the rights of people confined in prisons and jails, employment discrimination, and disability rights. He graduated magna cum laude from the NYU School of Law. On graduating from law school, he served as law clerk for the Honorable Stephen Breyer, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and for the Honorable Harry T. Edwards of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Received his AB from Brown University. Professor Reinert, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman Nadler, Subcommittee Chairman Cohen, Vice Chair Ross, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Alex Reinert. I'm the Max Freund Professor of Litigation and Advocacy at the Benjamin M. Cardozo School of Law, and this semester I'm the Visiting Professor of Law at Cornell Law School. Thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding civil rights litigation reform and qualified immunity. Today I speak in my personal capacity alone, not for either of the institutions with which I am currently affiliated. As a law professor, I have researched, written, and taught about civil rights litigation and qualified immunity for many years. Over this time, I've been invited on multiple occasions to conduct workshops for federal judges and their law clerks addressing civil rights litigation. And as an attorney, I've litigated civil rights cases now for more than 20 years, arguing cases at every level of the federal judicial system. My perspective on qualified immunity is informed by all of this experience. My written testimony has already been submitted, so with the time allotted to me, I intend to highlight some of what I cover in that statement, albeit in not as much detail. I'll begin with a broad sketch of qualified immunity. We've heard some of it already before we drill down to some specifics. So what is it? It's a defense that government officials can raise when they are sued for damages for violating the Constitution. It protects them from liability unless the law governing their conduct was clearly established. It applies in a wide range of contexts to conduct that all would agree is egregious in cases involving serious injury and even death. It can even apply, frankly, when the defendant intends to violate the Constitution. It is a judicially created immunity that stems from the Supreme Court's erroneous interpretation of 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. It's not in the statute or required by statute, and to be clear, it is not required by the Constitution, and it is an anomaly. That is why today qualified immunity is being questioned on multiple grounds across the political spectrum. Indeed, probably one of the few things that brings Justice Clarence Thomas and Sona Sotomayor together is their hostility to qualified immunity, albeit for different reasons. The requirement that there be clearly established law is the most significant part of the doctrine. As the Supreme Court has described it, this means that a plaintiff has to show that prior case law from either the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals has to have made the unlawfulness of the officer's conduct so obvious that only an incompetent officer would not see it. 
And many lower courts have interpreted this to mean that a plaintiff has to show a prior case that found a constitutional violation for the same right and on nearly identical facts. I provided a few examples in my written testimony, as have other witnesses at this hearing. They're just the tip of the iceberg, and I expect some of the other panelists will discuss them, so I won't linger on them. What I think is most important to take from them is that even if the officer violates the Constitution, they can obtain protection from qualified immunity simply because there was no prior case law finding a violation on exactly the same facts. And like ranking member Johnson, I think we should be a nation of laws. But qualified immunity interferes with enforcement of the highest law of the land, the Constitution, and in so doing, it undermines fundamental rule of law principles. Now, there are many flaws in this doctrine. First, who's left without a remedy? Americans whose rights have been violated. Make no mistake, qualified immunity means that the people who have been killed or seriously injured bear all of the costs of constitutional violations. That's both wrong and unnecessary. Of course, qualified immunity also makes it harder for the law to develop because courts routinely decide cases without ever addressing whether there is a constitutional violation in the first place. They just say it hasn't been clearly established, which means that clearly established law never develops for future cases. It also creates long delays in the civil justice system because of the right of defendants to immediately appeal and ping pong a case back and forth between a trial court and appeals court before there's ever a trial. And of course, because we count on civil litigation to deter future constitutional violations, qualified immunity makes it more likely that officers and police departments will never learn from their mistakes. It blunts the power of civil litigation to incentivize systemic reform. Now, as federal lawmakers are discussing ending qualified immunity and state legislatures around the country have also debated uh, this legis legislation like this, you'll no doubt hear objections from some law enforcement groups that this will make it harder to be an officer because qualified immunity protects them from individual liability. And I want to say this loud and clear, that is the most pernicious fiction that exists in the debate around this doctrine. Law enforcement officers almost never pay judgments in civil rights cases. Municipalities and states already routinely identify officers, even for egregious misconduct. And there's also insurance available for officers. And the substantive constitutional law already provides ample protection against second guessing. This is a doctrine that poses substantial barriers to relief. Uh, it, it prevents the enforcement of the highest land of our law, and it leaves the cost of constitutional violations to be borne by the victims, an inexcusable consequence in a country that purports to be governed by the rule of law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, sir. Our next witness is live and in person, Ms. Tiffany Wright. She's an adjunct faculty member at Howard Eats. School of Law, supervising attorney of its Human and Civil Rights Clinic. She was one of the lead attorneys in Taylor v. Riojas, a 2020 case in which the U.S. Supreme Court, without even requiring oral arguments, summarily reversed a grant of qualified immunity to prison guards who subjected an inmate to inhumane conditions. The Taylor decision was one of only a handful of times when the court has reversed a grant of qualified immunity. Professor Wright received her J.D. magna cum laude from uh, Georgetown. Law Center. She was an editor of the Georgetown Law Journal and editor-in-chief of its annual review of criminal procedure. She served as law clerk to the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, the Honorable David Tattle of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and the Honorable jo Royce Lambert of the U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia. Professor Wright, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, uh, Chairman Nattler, Chairman Cohen, Vice Chair Ross, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Tiffany Wright, and I direct the Civil Rights Clinic at the Howard University School of Law. Two years ago, I represented a man named Trent Taylor. Mr. Taylor was incarcerated in a Texas prison when jail officials alleged that he tried to take his own life. Mr. Taylor was transferred to a psychiatric prison facility ostensibly to receive mental health treatment, Instead, Mr. Taylor was stripped naked and placed in a cell covered in massive amounts of feces. He could not eat for fear of contamination. He could not drink because even the water faucet was packed with feces. After four days, the guards moved Mr. Taylor to a second cell, which in addition to being filthy, had no furniture and was very cold. So Mr. Taylor was forced due to a clogged drain in the middle of the floor as he was still naked to sleep in the human waste of other people. 
This was intentional. Guards ignored Mr. Taylor's pleas for help, wished him a long weekend, and said that they hoped he would freeze. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit granted qualified immunity to the guards, although every federal circuit, including the Fifth Circuit itself, has held that forced exposure to human waste violates the Constitution. The Fifth Circuit decided that because Mr. Taylor had only endured these conditions for just six days, the prior precedent did not qualify as clearly established. Thankfully, the Supreme Court intervened. The court held that this was an especially obvious case, that the constitutional violation was so clear that no reasonable officer could have thought otherwise. Taylor is extraordinary because it is just the third time in history that the Supreme Court has intervened to reverse a grant of qualified immunity, but it has done the opposite in more than 30 cases. Taylor is not extraordinary because of its facts. The Supreme Court routinely refuses to act in cases with facts just as abhorrent as Taylor. And people like Mr. Taylor are the people that I routinely represent, and in three ways, qualified immunity makes it impossible for them to get any measure of justice or accountability. First, many victims do not have the resources to obtain legal representation. I have met with many clients who tell of spending months and years to find a lawyer, but are unable to do so because lawyers cannot risk the time it takes to litigate a case only to be shut down by qualified immunity. Second, quali qualified immunity impu impedes access to information because when the defense is raised in the early stages of a case, there is no discovery. And so victims can't even ask questions. I've represented the families of people killed who can't get basic information like autopsy reports, scene photographs, or investigative reports. Finally, qualified immunity appends the normal legal process. Mr. Taylor suffered the inhumane treatment in 2013. It would be seven years before the Supreme Court intervened to deny the qualified immunity defense. For six and a half of those years, Mr. Taylor alone, pro se, fought the state of Texas, who defended the indefensible. All of this means that the harm of qualified immunity falls on the victims. I've had the unfortunate task of sitting with victims who've suffered grievous losses and harms to tell them that there is no justice under the law for them. On the other side of the equation are police officers who are almost always indemnified. And when I appear with my clients who are families suffering in the worst way, when I appear with them at settlement negotiations and court hearings, the people on the other side are not officers who are fearful of losing their livelihoods. They are insurance adjusters who are worried about an insurance loss. Because even in the rare instances where qualified immunity fails, the cost is a matter of insurance loss, not a matter of officer's loss of financial stability. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Our next witness is Raphael Mangal. He is senior fellow and head of research for the Policing and Public Safety Initiative at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He's also a contributing editor for City Journal. He's authored and co-authored a number of Manhattan Institute reports and op-eds on issues ranging from urban crime and jail violence to broader matters of criminal and juvenile civil justice reform. In 2020, he was appointed to serve a four-year term as a member of the New York State Advisory Committee on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He received his J.D. from DePaul University, where he's president of the Federal Society, Vice President of the Appellate Moot Court Team. He received his BA from the City Uni University of New York's Baruch College. You're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you all so much for the honor and privilege to address this distinguished body on such an important issue. Um, I'd like to begin by noting that I am not entirely against the idea of reform when it comes to qualified immunity. At the end of my remarks, I'll offer what I think is a middle ground reform proposal that falls between outright abolition and the status quo. But while reform is worth considering some skepticism of the dominant narrative that has influenced both the discourse about qualified immunity and uh, uh, proposals to address it uh, is in order. That narrative has focused on the role that the defense has played in police litigation, particularly in suits related to uses of force. And it posits that qualified immunity is essentially functions as an unpierceable shield against liability for police officers, such that officers then internalize a sense of impunity that in turn leads them to misbehave in ways that they otherwise wouldn't if they had more financial skin in the game. 
As such, the abolition of qualified immunity is often held up as a way to significantly reduce excessive uses of force and other types of police misconduct. And while this narrative has succeeded in influencing both public opinion and various reform efforts, it is wrong for three reasons. First, this narrative assumes without evidence that officers regularly and accurately assess their likelihood of successfully mounting a qualified immunity defense in light of the binding precedents in their respective jurisdictions when deciding whether and if so how to use force. A sizable body of research has shown that in the context of situations involving the use of force, police officers overwhelmingly tend toward an intuitive decision-making process. The main reason for this tendency is that the encounters in which these decisions are generally made tend to be rapidly unfolding in volatile situations that simply don't lend themselves to the type of analysis that would go into an officer assessing his or her risk of personal liability based on the type and level of force used. The second reason that the standard story about qualified immunity doesn't hold water is that the available data seem to undermine the claim that defense accounts for a significant share of police litigation outcomes. For example, the Legal Aid Society maintains a database of lawsuits filed against the New York City Police Department between January 2015 and to June 2018. If you, fil if you filter those 2,400 cases by disposition, it produces just 74 cases resolved in favor of the police defendants. Even if all 74 were disposed of on qualified immunity grounds, we are still only talking about 3% of the cases in the database. I'd also like to point the subcommittee to an empirical assessment of qualified immunity published in a 2017 issue of the Yale Law Journal by UCLA law professor and noted qualified immunity abolitionist, Joanna Schwartz, which found that less than 4% of the more than 1,100 cases analyzed resulted in whole or partial grants of dismissal or summary judgment on qualified immunity grounds. As Professor Schwartz noted in the Wall Street Journal in response to this very argument less than two years ago, unsuccessful cases against police tend to fail because of other procedural and substantive infirmities, not qualified immunity. And in that very same letter to the editor, Professor Schwartz went on to note that abolishing qualified immunity won't flood the courts with frivolous suits, which undermines any suggestion that the explanation for why qualified immunity does not account for a particularly large share of police litigation outcomes owes to some large number of cases that did not get filed in anticipation of being disposed of on immunity grounds. The third major flaw in the dominant narrative about qualified immunity is that abolishing the defense, as has been noted already, won't actually result in police officers having more financial skin in the game because it's not actually the true source of financial protection for officers. That's because when individual officers are successfully sued, which is relatively often, their employers indemnify them against liability, that is, they pick up the tab. A 2014 study found that governments already pay approximately 99.98% of the dollars that plaintiffs recovered in lawsuits alleging civil rights violations by law enforcement. Now, while the idea that qualified immunity reform will significantly reduce police use of support is misguided, it is still worth considering ways to limit the number of cases in which constitutional harms go without redress. In 2001, in a case called Saucier versus Katz, the Supreme Court stated that qualified immunity analyses should first assess whether a right was violated before assessing whether the right was clearly established. Unfortunately, however, the Supreme Court reversed itself eight years later in Pearson versus Callahan, which gave judges the discretion to skip step one of this analysis. And so the short, ground, the short version of my middle ground proposal is to consider legislatively reestablishing the Saucier sequence because requiring courts to confront the constitutional or statutory questions before them in 1983 cases would both promote the development of the law in the civil rights arena, and it would more quickly shrink the scope of not yet established rights. Preventing courts from leaving these questions unanswered may not eliminate the potential for grants of immunity based on dubious factual distinctions from prior cases, but it will prevent situations in which multiple officers in the same jurisdictions get to avail themselves of qualified immunity in cases involving the same conduct over a period of time simply because courts have continually punted the same question. Another reason I think it's worth reconsidering the Saucier sequence is that it is often assumed that grants of immunity based on the clearly established prong of the analysis actually involve actual violations of constitutional or federal civil rights, but this is not obviously the case. Making it clear to the public that liability is denied because the conduct wasn't actually unconstitutional is an important end to pursue. I hope the statement contributes to a better understanding of the realities of this important debate, and I look forward to addressing any questions raised by these points as best I can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next witness is Jay Schweikert, Senior Research Fellow for the Project on Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. His research and advocacy focuses on accountability for prosecutors and law enforcement, including a specific focus on the doctrine of qualified immunity in most recent years. Before jo joining Cato, he spent four years doing civil and criminal litigation at Williams and Connolly. Earned his JD from Harvard Law School, where he was an articles editor for the Harvard Law Review and chaired the Harvard Federal Society's Student 
colloquium program, colloquium program, whatever. Following in law school, he clerked for the Honorable Diane Sykes of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit and Honorable Lawrence Silberman, U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. He holds a BA in political science and economics from Yale University. Having graduated from two Ivy schools, some would say he is not qualified for the Supreme Court. I would say <laughs> that he is. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chair Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for convening this hearing and giving me the opportunity to express my views on this crucial subject. For the last four years, I've been leading Cato's strategic campaign to challenge the doctrine of qualified immunity, which we see as the biggest impediment to meaningful accountability in the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, the national debate around qualified immunity has given rise to several persistent misconceptions about what the doctrine actually is and what eliminating or reforming it would actually entail. And in my comments today, I'd like to focus on three of those in particular. First, the misconception that qualified immunity protects good faith mistakes of judgment by the police. Second, the misconception that qualified immunity protects against frivolous lawsuits. And third, the misconception that reforming qualified immunity would damage the integrity or morale of the law enforcement community. So first, qualified immunity is not a good faith defense, and it is not necessary to protect the discretion of police officers to make difficult on-the-spot decisions in the field. In other words, it does not protect honest mistakes. The doctrine of qualified immunity only matters when a public official has, in fact, violated someone's federally protected rights. That means if a police officer has, ha has not committed any constitutional violation, then by definition, they don't need qualified immunity to protect themselves because they haven't broken the law in the first place. And the Supreme Court has made crystal clear that when police officers make good faith mistakes of judgment, such as arresting someone who turns out to be innocent, or using force that turns out with the benefit of hindsight to have been unnecessary, they have not violated the Fourth Amendment at all so long as they acted reasonably. In other words, deference to reasonable on-the-spot decisions by police officers is already baked into our substantive Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. The Fourth Amendment is what protects good faith decisions by police, not qualified immunity. The cases where qualified immunity ends up mattering aren't those where officers made reasonable mistakes of judgment. They're the cases where officers acted in bad faith, but where a court simply had yet to address that exact scenario. Um, we could do nothing but list examples of this all day, but I'll just give two to flesh out what this means in practice. In a case called Jessup versus City of Fresno, the Ninth Circuit granted immunity to officers alleged to have stolen over $200,000 in cash and rare coins while executing a search warrant. In other words, they were alleged to have abused their authority for their own personal enrichment. Now, obviously, these officers were not acting in good faith, and no one contended that they were. But they still received qualified immunity for the sole reason that the Ninth Circuit had yet to address that exact scenario. Similarly, in a case called Frazier versus Evans, the Tenth Circuit granted immunity to officers who knowingly violated a man's First Amendment rights by harassing, threatening to arrest, and illegally searching him, all because he recorded them in public. Now, these officers had been explicitly trained by their department that citizens do have a First Amendment right to record the police in public. So far from acting in good faith, they had actual knowledge they were violating his rights. But they received qualified immunity because the Tenth Circuit, unlike six other circuits, had yet to address that exact question. Second, qualified immunity does not protect against frivolous civil rights claims. Again, the doctrine only matters where one, a public official has violated someone's rights, but two, a court holds that those rights were not clearly established at the time of the violation. So by definition, it only makes a difference where the underlying case is meritorious. If a civil rights suit is actually frivolous, in other words, if it lacks legal or factual merit, then other tools of civil procedure are perfectly capable of dismissing those claims. And this is indeed borne out by Professor Joanna Schwartz's 2017 article, How Qualified Immunity Fails, where she found that only a minuscule fraction of Section 1983 cases, 0.6%, were dismissed prior to discovery on the basis of qualified immunity. In other words, notwithstanding qualified immunity's purported value in sparing defendants from having to litigate non-meritorious cases, the doctrine almost never achieves this intended goal. Third, reforming qualified immunity would not hurt retention of morale in the law enforcement community. In fact, the exact opposite is true. 
Qualified immunity itself hurts the law enforcement community by depriving officers of the public trust and confidence that's necessary for them to do their job safely and effectively. Policing is dangerous, difficult work, and public perception of accountability is absolutely essential to police effectiveness. Yet in the aftermath of many high-profile police killings, most obviously the murder of George Floyd, Gallup reported that trust in police officers had reached record lows, and that for the first time ever, less than half of Americans placed confidence in their police force. This drop in confidence was driven in large part by the perception that officers who commit misconduct are rarely held accountable. So qualified immunity exacerbates what is already a crisis of confidence in law enforcement. Even if only a small proportion of officers routinely violate the law, if those officers are not held accountable, the community as a whole suffers a reputational loss. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Arthur Ago is Director of Criminal Justice Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Before joining the Lawyers Committee in November of 2019, he spent close to two decades at the Public Defender Service for District of Columbia, representing indigent children and adults facing serious delinquency and felony criminal charges in D.C., ultimately serving as his trial chief. He's also been an adjunct professor in the Georgetown University Law Center, uh, American University Co Washington College of Law, and the University of the District of Columbia David A. Clark School of Law. Received his JD from George Washington University Law School, his MA from the Asian American Studies, uh, in Asian American Studies, excuse me, from the University of California, UCLA, and his BA from Amherst. Uh, I recommend for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, Chairman Cohn, Vice Chair Ross, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of this subcommittee. My name is Arthur Ago, and I am the Director of the Criminal Justice Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about qualified immunity and how it both undermines civil rights and is a barrier to police accountability. The Lawyers Committee has been a leader in the battle for equal rights since it was created in 1963 at the request of President Kennedy to enlist the private legal bar's leadership and resources in combating racial discrimination. Our criminal justice project works to protect equal justice under the law by confronting the ways in which racism infects every stage of our criminal justice system, including advocating for and working toward increased police accountability. Approximately two years ago, in the wake of the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and far too many other people of color, tens of millions of Americans took to the streets to protest enduring police abuse and violence, particularly against communities of color, and to demand a fundamental transformation of policing. We commend the U.S. House of Representatives for twice passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in response. But as you know, because the Justice and Policing Act has yet to be enacted, the country has not seen those transformative changes. Nevertheless, Congress has the opportunity today to take a critical step in achieving this necessary transformation by abolishing the doctrine of qualified immunity. In the simplest of terms, qualified immunity undermines civil rights in the United States. In the years following emancipation and the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1871, which includes the well-known Section 1983. The act was the direct result of a congressional desire to secure to all, uh, all citizens, including formerly enslaved people, the rights guaranteed to them by the Constitution. What the act emphatically did not contain and what the Constitution emphatically does not contain and what this Congress has never legislated is a way to immunize those who violate others' civil rights under color of law. It was the Supreme Court of the United States and not Congress a century after 1871 that created the defense of qualified immunity it is a defense that enables police officers to have an otherwise meritorious civil rights case dismissed even when no one disputes those officers' conduct. And as you have heard from my fellow witnesses, it is a defense that is fundamentally flawed because it creates too high a burden on victims of police abuse and misconduct, preventing these victims from having their day in court. I am certain that we will discuss the specific ways that the judge made qualified immunity defense is flawed during the course of the hearing today. But I would like to take a moment to emphasize the tragic effect that qualified immunity has had on people of color, and in particular, black people. Black Americans are three times more likely than white Americans to be killed by the police, and Latinos nearly twice as frequently as white people. Although black people make up only about 13% of the US population, black Americans account for 26% of those killed by the police, and about 37% of those killed while unarmed 
and in all use of force cases, depending on how you define the different types of force, including those not resulting in death, black people and Latinos experience police use of force 50% more often than white people, and up to three and a half times more often, depending on the type of force. Despite these devastating numbers, Americans, and especially people of color, are unable to hold police accountable through other avenues. Police do not effectively police themselves, nor can Americans rely on the criminal justice system for accountability. From 2005 to 2020, police across the country have fatally shot approximately 15,000 people. Of those, 110 were charged and only 40 convicted. What remains for victims of police misconduct is accountability in civil court through civil lawsuits against police officers who commit misconduct. This is precisely what Congress envisioned in 1871, but the Supreme Court has severely restricted this avenue of police accountability since it, since it established qualified immunity. It is now time for Congress to act and for this body to return the Civil Rights Act of 1871 to its original intent, which is to allow redress for people whose constitutional rights were violated by, by those, including law enforcement, acting under color of law, violations that continue to be endured disproportionately by black people and other people of color. I urge you to seize this opportunity. Thank you for asking me to appear before you today to share the views of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for appearing before us, and thank you for your testimony. Our final witness is Captain Frederick Thomas. Captain Thomas is president of the National... Excuse me? Johnson. Oh, I skipped Mr. Johnson. Well, no, I didn't skip Mr. Johnson. Our next to final witness is Captain Frederick Thomas. <laughs> Captain Thomas is president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, an organization of professional CEOs and officers in the field of law enforcement. He assumed Noble's presidency, uh, Noble being the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, in August 2021 has been an organization for 11 years. He's also a captain in the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office and has over 30 years of experience as a law enforcement officer. He is also a military combat veteran. Captain Thomas received his bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Grambling State University in 1989 when Eddie Robinson was still there, I think. Still there. Late, later in 2013, he earned a master's of science degree in law enforcement corrections from Southern University, A&M. He is a recipient of numerous commendations and awards. Captain Thomas, you're recognized for five minutes as our penultimate witness. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Jared Nadler, ranking member, Congressman Jim Jordan, Subcommittee Chairman Congressman Steve Cohen, Ranking Member Congressman Mike Johnson, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a testimony regarding qualified immunity on the behalf of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, otherwise known as NOVA. My name is Frederick Gale Thomas. I'm also a captain with the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office, which is located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I have been in law enforcement profession 30 years and 26 years in the Louisiana Army National Guard from which I retired. I am a U.S. military combat veteran who served in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Noble members serve at every level of command in federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. 50 chapters across the nation we represent thousands of individuals, including criminal justice practitioners. Our members are as diverse as the nation. We protect and serve their views very just as much. However, we, are all, we all agree that qualified immunity needs to be revisited. Noble is honored to testify in hopes of addressing the unintended consequences and many misconceptions that keep us from police reform. The clearly established standards in the current doctrine set a high bar that favors law enforcement. But getting rid of qualified immunity altogether threatens public safety. Instead, Noble proposed threatening trust and legitimacy between communities and law enforcement and making police more humane and effective. In my experience, the unresolved issues around police violence and the failure to create safeguards that address the present imbalance have had consequences on law enforcement agencies across the country. Recruitment and retention rate are at all-time low. 
State and local government budgets are strained to their insurance limits, and officer performance and morale have been negatively impacted. Mobile believes in doing the right thing for the public. We call for our professions to come together to provide reasonable recommendations to our legislators. The problem is misinformation. Our saving grace is unity. As public servants, we must share our expertise with transparency so you can make a real federal policy change. Nova Joint Law Enforcement Organization nationwide to propose the assessment of claims of qualified immunity based on whether an officer conduct was objectively and reasonable or if there was a fair notice that the conduct violates a constitutional right. Fair notice allows plaintiffs to point to the related case laws to prove the conduct in question and unconstitutional. The objectively reasonable standard accounts for the situations where there is no previous case laws related, related to the conduct in question. These recommendations recommendation ease the burden on plaintiffs while ensuring law enforcement officers are still appropriately protected. They increase transparency and better ensure those who engage in gross misconduct are held accountable. Noble know firsthand the history of civil rights in this country. We know it from the legislative experience, we know it from our law enforcement experience, and most important, we know it from personal experience. This intimate knowledge let us understand this is not a black and white issue. Real reform required us to explore best practices, practices such as improving officer training in de-escalating de -escalating tactics, crisis intervention, and deploying effective alternates to legal force. Embracing procedural justice, instituting more selective recruiting methods and standards, and reimagining public safety without depending so much on the police. We lend our expertise as public servants to creating a nation that united, balanced, and ensures justice for all. We dare to reimagine police based on dialogue, examining, examination, and allocation of resources. We believe that oversight will help us build trust and transparency in our neighborhoods, especially communities of color. This is a noble profession. Most police officers do their job every day with respect and commitment to the values and life of our democracy. Noble was founded in 1976 during a three-day symposium to discuss high crime rates in the black urban communities. Today, this organization represents over 3,400 members who serve all communities and all Americans. In closing, NOVA supports comprehensive legislation that improves law enforcement in all ways at all levels. Police reform and qualified immunity are complex issues. We encourage all interested parties in law enforcement and Congress to come together to address them. I thank you, Chairman Nadler and the committee members for supporting our profession and listening to the voice of NOVA members and for the invitation to appear today. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You know my Chief Davis, I presume. Sir. Chief Davis in Memphis? Yes. Yes. She's, uh -huh. she's a, we hope she's a star. She appears to be a star. We're okay. Star. Thank you, sir. And now our final witness we've all been waiting for, Mr. William Johnson. He's the Executive Director and General Counsel of the National Association of Police Organizations, Coalition of Police Unions, and Associations from across the United States. He represents more than 241,000 law enforcement officers, 1,000 police units and associations. In his role as executive director, Mr. Johnson is responsible for NAPO's day-to-day -day operations, testifies for Congress, provides advocacy before various governmental bodies. He received his JD from Georgetown University's Law Center, an undergraduate degree from Brown University, holds a postgraduate certificate in nonprofit leadership and management from Michigan State University. Uh, Mr. Izzo's team. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Mr. Cullen, uh, Chair Mr. Nadler, Vice Chair Ms. Ross, and Ranking Member Mr. Johnson, and the distinguished members of this subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the rank and file officers on this critical issue of qualified immunity. First of all, it is vitally important from our view to emphasize what qualified immunity is and what it is not. Qualified immunity, when it applies at all, 
is limited in scope to a small subset of civil lawsuits. To determine whether qualified immunity applies in any given situation, a court must ask whether it would have known, would have been known to a reasonable officer that the alleged conduct was unlawful in the situation she confronted at the time of the incident itself. If a reasonable officer could not have known that the conduct was unlawful, then she is immune from further civil liability, but only as to that particular allegation. Qualified immunity is therefore an issue of fundamental fairness. It only has effect when plaintiff's attorneys allege liability on the part of an officer based upon the violation of a right that in fact was not known or defined at the time of the incident. Qualified immunity also simply does not apply at all outside this small subset of particular civil cases. It has nothing to do with cases such as the prosecution of Minnesota officers in the George Floyd case, nor any other prosecutions of officers. The officers involved in the death of Mr. Floyd were arrested, charged, and convicted. They are already incarcerated or pending sentencing. The same holds true in the prosecutions of police officers in the Dante Wright, Botham John, Walter Scott, Rodney King, and Breonna Taylor cases. The doctrine does not and cannot affect such cases at all. Secondly, the doctrine of qualifying immunity itself is one repeatedly recognized by our Supreme Court as part of its constitutional jurisprudence. The same, it was not invented by police unions or police associations or police departments. The same independent judiciary that the Constitution requires to supervise officers in matters such as warrant issuance and execution, evidence collection, Miranda warnings, and the affording of due process rights to suspects has also recognized that a functioning society requires that reasonable officers be provided this qualified immunity in applicable civil cases. Without it, the orderly administration of justice would come to a halt amidst the paralyzing fear of personal liability for unknowingly violating an unknown and unknowable right. Qualified immunity thus does not make officers immune to state or federal criminal charges for wrongful act, and it does not protect officers from internal investigations or disciplinary actions, including termination. Another area that it falls to NAPO to emphasize as the only rank and file entity present today is the vital importance of qualified immunity to individual frontline officers. It is these men and women who perform the most difficult and dangerous roles in our society. The policymakers and administrators who define and assign the tasks that our members are to perform are generally not themselves at risk of personal liability for their decisions. Line officers, as a rule, do not have the financial resources or the institutional personnel at their disposal to defend themselves from unfounded allegations that agencies, municipalities, and higher ranking officials do. The line officer, like other working persons of modest means, must thus place her confidence in the court system and the integrity of justice, the integrity of judges, to correctly apply this constitutional standard. Related to this point, we note that there have not been similar calls for reform or abrogation of qualified immunity for firefighters, EMTs, code enforcement officers, construction inspectors, or other public act actors, all of whom also have duties that directly impact the health, safety, and very lives of citizens. The next to last point I wish to raise concerns the consequences of doing away with qualified immunity. While qualified officers by definition are able to choose another less hazardous, whether physically, psychologically, or financially line of work, the public, however, needs and relies upon experienced officers. Police work, like many other professions, is not learned overnight, particularly in specific areas of law enforcement, such as sexual assault, homicide, crimes against children, and anti-terror. Years and years of training and experience are required before an officer becomes really good at their job. If one of us or a family member was a victim of such a crime, we would want officers and detectives with decades of experience handling that case. Doing away with qualified immunity cuts directly against this public policy good. Legitimate, proactive policing would be discouraged and chilled. In summary, a knowing violation of a right already entails significant administrative, economic, and even criminal liability for officers and the agencies that employ them. Qualified immunity reform is, in our view, largely a solution in search of a problem. Since this type of reform would only serve to impose liability in cases where no reasonable officer could have known that a right was being violated, it cannot, by definition, improve policing nor deter misconduct. The public policy tendency of such reform is to create an incentive for officers to do nothing, since they cannot, by definition, know if they might be personally liable 
in any given situation in which they do act. And that has resulted in no citizen and certainly no member of this house as a lawmaker should countenance. Thank you very much and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. That completes our witnesses and we appreciate each. We now proceed under the five minute rule with questions where, uh, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Judge Newman, um, why do you propose making municipalities liable for the acts of their employees in constitutional tort cases as part of a solution to the problems as you see posed by qualified immunity doctrine? We need, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? Just to start my time over. Start my time over. You hear me yeah, now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, Marcel, okay. Marcel, Marcel. I, I, I propose it for two reasons. First, I think it's the right thing to do. I don't see why uh, employers should be liable for every tort except a constitutional tort. And my second reason, quite relevant to this hearing is, let me begin by answering it this way. As your witnesses have indicated, qualified immunity is a highly controversial topic. Uh, you, you know that, and that's why you're having your hearing. If you create municipal liability, you substantially diffuse the problem of qualified immunity and increase the chances of both having an effective remedy for the violation of constitutional rights and indeed increase the chances of passing a bill. With qualified immunity so controversial, I think the chances of modifying it um, are, are very low. You all would know that better than I do, but I urge employer liability coupled with suit by the United States, both to diffuse the controversy. If you did that, you don't even need qualified immunity. Indeed, as I pointed out, you don't even need police officer liability, which ought to find common ground among the police because the plaintiff would sue the United States, would sue the city and the United States could bring the action. So any plaintiff would say, why should I bother suing the police officer? I might as well sue the city. Uh, so it would strengthen the remedy, it would diffuse the problem, it would enhance the chances of getting anything done in this highly controversial area. Thank you, Judge. So, so in essence, if we, if we did this, Mr. Johnson's clients should be happy, Mr. Captain Thomas and his folks should be happy, and everybody be happy. Is that right? I, th I, th I really think, in all modesty, there's a good chance that that would occur. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Ago, you confused me entirely. You said that this doctrine was created by the courts, and yet most of my colleagues that support this doctrine without change support judges who are strict constructionists. How does that? How do, how do you reconcile that? I can't do it. It's really a quandary to me. Uh, uh, thank you, Congressman Cohn, for your question. Um, without uh, trying to avoid the question, I don't want to get between you and your colleagues. Um, I, I, Come I, on. <laughs> I, I, I would say I'm that, talking about my colleagues in the Senate. <laughs> um, I, I, will, I will say that it, it is a mystery as to why and how this happened, that in, in essence, what happened was in 1967 and then refined really in 19... Um, 83, uh, I'm sorry, 1982, the Supreme Court of the United States, in essence, injected itself into the legislative process by writing into the Civil Rights Act of 1871 this defense of qualified immunity. It's nothing that appears in the Civil Rights Act, and it's nothing that appears in the Constitution, and now is the opportunity for this Congress to, to effectively say that the Supreme Court should not, done that, should not have done that. Uh, especially when there are members of the Supreme Court on both sides of the political spectrum that are troubled by qualified immunity. Thank you, sir. Um, Professor Reinert, can you please help us with how the relevant legal history, which we kind of discussed there, does not justify importing the defense of qualified immunity into 1983? What's your thought about that? Sure, just to, just to elaborate a little bit, what the Supreme Court did that was so wrong was it said in the 1967 case uh, that it would assume that the common law immunities that applied in 1871 would be imported into the Civil Rights Act. Now, that was wrong for two reasons. One was there was no common law immunity that looks anything like 
the qualified immunity of today. That's error number one. Error number two is the Reconstruction Congress in 1871 said when it enacted the statute that's the precursor to Section 1983 says we don't want state law interfering with this right. They said it in explicit language. Um, so there's two reasons that the Supreme Court went off on the wrong road to, elabor to, to announcing this judge-made doctrine of qualified immunity, which, has, which is not constitutionally required, contrary to my friend, Mr. Johnson. It has nothing to do with the Constitution. It is simply an interpretation of a statute, which is erroneous. Thank you, sir. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you know my friend, Agatha Cole? Uh, yes, I do. Well, she's made herself distinguished. She wrote the amicus brief in West Virginia versus EPA, and uh, I was very proud of her for doing that. And she invited me to your law school, and I appeared there before your uh, student body one time, and she's a star. Yeah. Thank she was a wonderful sir. student of mine, so. Well, that's, she, she, learnt, she owes it all to you then. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I want to ask unanimous consent that we enter into the record the statement from the Constitutional Accountability Center and a statement from the Major Cities Chiefs Association. Without objection, it will be done. And I now recognize Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record today uh, this statement by Chief Sheriff, uh, or statement by Sheriff Greg Champagne. He's the former president, current second vice president, and chair of Legal Affairs Committee of the National Sheriff's Association. Without objection, I hope. Without objection, you hope rightly. Thank you, thank you. Um, I stated earlier, my questions are going to be for Mr. Johnson, and just uh, by, re by review for everyone listening, he's the executive director and general counsel of the National Association of Police Organizations, and grateful he can be with us uh, by Zoom. Um, there are a number of Democrat politicians I mentioned earlier who have spent the last several years, I mean, this is just a fact, and facts are stubborn things, as John Adams said, trying to take funding and resources away from police departments. I mean, that's just what happened. It seems insane to us. I think people are recognizing how crazy the idea is, but they've argued, ironically, that somehow this will make communities safer. And um, we don't have to look far to find uh, individuals who have advocated for those things. In fact, we've got several on this very committee. I mean, um, with respect, uh, Committee Chairman Nadler was asked uh, a while back whether the New York Police Department budget should be cut, and he said, yes, it certainly should be cut, quote, unquote. Uh, Mr. Johnson of Georgia serves on our Judiciary Committee. He, he was asked whether he supports defunding the police. He said, quote, we certainly can repurpose some of the funding, unquote. And of course, uh, Ms. Bush, who serves on this committee, sp spent approximately $200,000 in her campaign funds on private security detail last year, by the way. She's a leader, of course, of the defund the police movement. Every single one, every single one of my Democrat colleagues on this subcommittee have voted to end qualified immunity. So this is not, uh, these aren't political talking points. These are the facts. We have a, a disagreement on this very important issue. Mr. Johnson, question, how does it, um, what is your response when you hear uh, politicians who voice support for defunding the police when you serve law enforcement members uh, across the country who put their lives on the line every day to protect their communities? Thank you, ranking member. Um, as a political question, I, I think that that, um, that mantra is dying away. There certainly are some um, members of, of, of some political uh, officials who continue to tout that and some who say that in fact, uh, the Democratic Party or whatever party it is, hasn't gone far enough in a, in a progressive direction. I think that's incorrect. I think that the members of Congress and other elected officials who have been around longer realize that that uh, that message as a political message didn't sell well in 2020, certainly didn't sell well in 2021 in the elections in Virginia and New Jersey and so forth. Um, leaving aside the politics of it, just in terms of, um, I guess, the reality of, 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 of men and women on the ground, whether you're a police officer or not, I think public safety is, is the primary value without which Nothing else in a community can happen. Good schools, small business, people relocating to your community, none of that happens unless people feel safe in the community. And it doesn't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that people want police officers in their communities. They want ethical, honest, diligent police officers, but they want police officers. They want public safety. And they need it. 
and even though those were, it was political talking points and a political uh, uh, proposal and thing they were trying to advance, it had real world consequences. And so uh, the recruitment and the retention of police clearly has been affected by this defund the police movement and also by, I mean, we would imagine the eradication of qualified immunity. I've talked to law enforcement uh, officers and sheriffs and police chiefs in my district and they're deeply concerned that if, if, if qualified immunity were somehow to go away or be diminished, they would not be able to recruit and retain officers. Is that a real concern? It, it is, and it's, it's already happening. Uh, qualified immunity is, is one facet of, um, of, of, a, of a public um, campaign in some ways uh, to demonize the police or to blame the police for a lot of problems that they didn't create, but that somehow we find ourselves responsible at two o'clock in the morning when, when you call, we're, we're the people that show up here to say that there aren't people who shouldn't be police officers for whatever given reason. And when they're found out, they should be terminated, they should be prosecuted. All that has to happen. But in terms of policing itself, clearly uh, the continual mantra amongst not all, but some elected officials among the media uh, that the police are somehow to blame for society's ills, uh, it's inaccurate and just I mean, police, just like any other group, whether it's accountants or pharmacists or mechanics or a conditioning repair people, if constantly all you're hearing and your family is hearing is that you're part of the problem, that you're brutal, you're racist, you're ignorant, you can't be helped, you need to be reformed, this is just how they are, um, certainly it's detrimental to the morale and the effectiveness of any profession, and police are no exception to that. Thank you. Um for articulating that. I'm out of time, but I want to say, as you noted, this is not rocket science. We need to apply common sense here. I yield back. Thank you. I just want to comment. It's like Ukraine has brought Democrats, and most Democrats and Republicans together. Uh, qualified immunity has meant the Democrats have called a Cato Institute person as our witness, and the Republicans called a union official as theirs. <laughs> Mr. Natalie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start by uh, setting the record straight. Mr. Johnson said that I suggested uh, de uh, uh, decreasing the funding of the New York City Police Department. It is true. Uh, there was a movement at that time to shift some of the functions of the police department to another city, to another city department. I agreed with that. And the, as, as the function uh, went from one department to the other, so should the funding associated with that function, but the total funding was not suggested to be decreased. Mr. Schweikert, do you agree that qualified immunity has failed as a matter of law, doctrine, and public policy? And if so, why? I do agree with that. Um, I think it's failed as a matter of law for reasons that Professor Reinhardt has already ably explained. It was simply an, an invention of the Supreme Court. Um, while there is some dispute about whether the early Supreme Court cases employing an actual good faith understanding of qualified immunity had some support in common law. There is no dispute at all amongst any scholars today that the current clearly established law standard is absolutely unsupported by either the text of Section 1983 or uh, the history on which it was passed. And it's failed as a matter of, uh, as a practical and moral matter because it, it has denied justice to victims whose rights have been violated and it has undermined the efficacy of the law enforcement community by exacerbating the public's unfortunately accurate perception that police officers who routinely commit misconduct are not held accountable. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wright, first off, congratulations on your victory in the Supreme Court litigating Taylor versus Rojas. It's an incredible accomplishment and we commend you for your work litigating on behalf of Mr. Taylor. It seems the Supreme Court almost always decides its qualified immunity cases through, through the shadow docket. Can you, can you describe why this practice is problematic? Thank you for your question, Chairman. Uh, the, the practice of deciding cases on the shadow docket is problematic for a number of reasons. First, it, it puts the processes of the Supreme Court behind a curtain that shields it from public view. And so when a case is decided on the shadow docket, there is no public argument. There are not even briefs on the merits. And so it prevents the public from understanding what's happening and it allows the Supreme Court to make law and even some policy decisions that govern parts of the United States without any uh, transparency into the process. And so that's problem number one. Problem number two is when you decide these cases specifically on the shadow docket, qualified immunity cases, these are often cases where the facts are in some dispute and when you do it 
on the cert stage briefs alone, there is no opportunity for the parties to air that disagreement or to put the actual questions and the actual facts before the court. And so it impedes lawmaking and impedes public trust in the judiciary processes. Thank you. Captain Thomas, how does qualified immunity exacerbate our accountability crisis among law enforcement? Accountability piece, that's what we're trying to do now. I'm saying, because we got to make people believe that the police are here to do the right thing at all times. The qualified immunity piece, we had officers now, we just came up in Louisiana, they're actually buying umbrella policies just to protect their families. So taking this uh, qualified immunity out of this, out of this such talk, we just, we've been in a situation that we can't control. We couldn't control it. So we all need to just get together. That's why we're here with Congress. That's why I'm glad we have our colleagues here so we can discuss this thing because we need more talking on them points. Thank you. Judge Newman, can you explain how qualified immunity undermines official accountability and precludes individuals from effectively vindicating their constitutional rights? Well, I don't want to see the matter overstated. I think it does that in some cases and in some cases not. Uh, I, I've heard the statistics today that very few cases are dismissed on qualified immunity, but in the 30 cases I presided over at trials of the district court, most of them resulted in a jury finding in favor of the police officer. And I think qualified immunity uh, was simply uh, a doctor. They didn't understand it. We did a poll later of all the jurors who heard these cases. It was clear they didn't understand the doctrine at all. And uh, my sense was they were simply finding for the police officer because they didn't want him to have to pay and they were unaware that the city was going to pay. So it undermined it in the sense that it tilted the scales in favor of uh, a verdict for the police officer in a case. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ale uh, Reinert, Proponents of qualified immunity often argue that the doctrine is necessary to protect officers from being subjected to second guessing of their split second decisions. Can you explain why this viewpoint is incorrect? Yeah, it goes to something that Mr. Schweiker uh, laid out in great detail uh, in his testimony. The basic reason it's unnecessary to protect officers from being second guessed is because the substantive law already does that. That is, I can't violate the Fourth Amendment as an officer unless I act unreasonably in light of all the facts that I know, in light of the circumstances, taking into account split-second decisions I have to make. So already I'm protected by the substantive Fourth Amendment doctrine. It's therefore unnecessary to have an extra layer of protection that qualified immunity provides. What that does is it actually, in a way, protects the officers who come up with novel ways of violating people's constitutional rights, and then they're protected because no prior case had said that this particular way of violating someone's rights was unconstitutional. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I believe, defers to Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock, you be next. Then. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Schweikert, does, does qualified immunity only apply to the police, or does it apply to all public officials? Thank you, Congressman. Um, qualified immunity applies across the board to all public officials who might be sued under Section 1980. So, for example, Lois Lerner violated the rights of, of thousands of Tea Party members by uh, abusing the authority of the Internal Revenue Service to go after them for their political views. Can she be sued by those victims of her, of her bad actions? In the context of federal officials, um, they are entitled to qualified immunity. There are also additional difficulties in suing them under the Bivens Doctrine because well, Section. I don't want to. Let's just stick to qualified. Right. Qualified immunity protects people like Lois Lerner from the effect of their actions. Correct. It does. Yes. Um, uh, could Michael Flynn sue uh, Andrew McCabe for the violation of his civil rights under this doctrine of qualified immunity? Qualified immunity would apply in any in any such suit. I, th I think it's unfortunate that this, this issue's been entangled with the, with the left's attacks on, on law enforcement and, and, and the rule of law. Um, yeah. the, the, the Fresno case that you mentioned uh, involving the theft of coins seized by a, a obviously crooked police officers. Now, you say they were shielded from the effect of their, from being sued by the victim by the doctrine of qualified immunity. They still broke the law, though, didn't they? They, they still stole the coins, didn't they? 
Absolutely, but the fact that they broke the law, even committed a criminal offense, is simply a different question than whether uh, there was clearly established law as to the constitutional violation they committed. So once they're convicted of that crime, can they be sued by the victim, or are, are those officers still shielded by uh, uh, qualified immunity? Even a criminal conviction would be an entirely separate matter. Uh, even a police officer who's convicted of murder for killing someone could still theoretically be protected by qualified immunity. So the victim would not be able to uh, uh, recover uh, uh, the cost that they had borne. That's correct. Because of this, this constitutional violation. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, em employer li liability that Judge Newman proposed seems to make sense. It would assure that there's a remedy for a violation of rights. It assures that individual officers wouldn't fa uh, face financial ruin. And it gives the local department then an incentive not to tolerate misconduct. Doesn't that make sense? I think part of it does. Yes, sir. Um, I think that there's already a tremendous incentive on the part of agencies to deter misconduct, uh, completely aside from qualified immunity. Uh, just the, um, the attention given by media, uh, by the press, by attorneys, uh, and so forth. There's, there's a tremendous spotlight on law enforcement in the United States, and there has been for several years now, uh, specifically regarding allegations yes. of misconduct. Well, and so I don't... Marshalling public opinion is one thing, but, but you know, actually having an avenue that you can take to, to protect your constitutional rights, that seems to me an, an important recourse uh, that was established back by the original law in 1871. Uh, Mr. Schweikert, is it the 1967 Warren decision that is the root of the problem, or is it the 82 modification on the, the clearly established standard? Uh, I think the 1982 decision in Harlow versus Fitzgerald is really the core of the problem, um, because it is the clearly established law standard, which is what governs today, and that's the standard that excuses even a, unreasonable or intentional constitutional violations so for the sole reason that there doesn't happen to be a prior judicial decision in that jurisdiction with similar facts. So if we codified the 1967 Warren test and yet explicitly removed the clearly established standard in the 1982 modification, would that be an improvement and would that be a, um, you know, would that solve the problem? I think it would be an improvement. Um, I don't think it would solve the problem because that would still leave some circumstances where someone's rights were violated and they're nevertheless left without a remedy. I think a better solution would be a shared liability regime between employers and employees and simply clarifying that uh, if the individual officer had an actual good faith belief in the legality of what, they're, of what they were doing, then it would simply be the employer who was liable, not the individual. But it's still essential to ensure that anyone whose rights are violated does get a remedy. Well, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the maxim is that, that for every right, there must be a remedy. If you don't have a remedy, then you really don't have the right. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McClintock. Next, we will let the tiger out of the cage, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's disappointing me that one of our esteemed colleagues chose to recycle debunked partisan dogma about defunding the police when it is his party that voted to oppose $350 billion in the American Rescue Plan that the majority used to fund the police and the firefighters and the first responders and the public health infrastructure. And they voted no. They voted not to fund the police and the other public employees. It's his party um, that had a couple dozen members who voted not to award the Congressional Gold Medal to members of the Capitol Police Force who risked their lives to defend our lives on January 6th against uh, a lethal, um, deadly, violent insurrection unleashed, unleashed against us. So spare us the phony lectures about defunding the police because everybody knows who wants to defund the police and who wants to defend the police and ask any of the 150 cops who were wounded, hospitalized, and injured on January the 6th right here at our own house. But it's disappointing me because this is an issue where we can have real bipartisan consensus, and we do. Take um, Fifth Circuit Court Judge Don Willette, a Trump appointee who has now 
distinguished himself as a strong critic of qualified immunity, which he says smacks of qual unqualified impunity, letting public officials duck consequences for bad behavior, no matter how palpably unreasonable, as long as they were the first to behave badly. So uh, it's a, a remarkable doctrine that has evolved up, totally made up by judges. Now, Judge Newman, um, you, you said something which I thought uh, had penetrating lucidity to it. Um, does the problem of qualified immunity go away entirely if we just decide to hold municipal employers accountable in respondeat superior fashion for the actions of their employees uh, in tort? Because the way I see this is that uh, by, by absolving their employers, then people want to sue the cops. But of course, the cop making fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year uh, is not is not really going to be able to pay um, if they beat the hell out of somebody. Um, and so then we've constructed all of these perverse doctrines to try to protect the cop, but we're avoiding the underlying issue, which is that there's no incentive to change the overall culture of policing in certain departments where they've given license to that kind of conduct. So would you just elaborate what you said before? Would the problem of qualified immunity go away if we correct the decisions that have immunized local police departments and states and uh, counties? Sure. Uh, whether it goes away would be entirely up to the legislation uh, you all came up with. Um, you could make employers liable and keep qualified immunity or you could make employers liable and abolish qualified immunity. So whether it would go away depends uh, on what you do with qualified immunity. The point is, once you create employer liability, you don't need qualified immunity. You don't even need liability of the police officer. But if you kept it, the, the plaintiffs would sue the, uh, the uh, employer. So if you kept it, it would probably be uh, almost a, a non-issue. And if you abolished it, then obviously it's a non-issue. Which way you go is up to you. But if you create- Am I recalling correctly that it was the Monell decision which said that the localities are not responsible? Uh, in okay. Not responsible unless they meet the, the, the ridiculously restrictive test of a, um, a policy of per, uh, uh, perpetrating misconduct. And, and cities don't do that. Well, look, I mean, I, I just think this is something that cuts against the, the fundamental conservative principles and liberal principles, and we've got to uh, deal with this problem quickly. And I thank you for having this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to you. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. Uh, next, I think we've got Mr. Roy from Texas. He yields to Ms. Fishbach. I'm sorry, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Johnson, I think Ranking Member Johnson had uh, asked you about um, how the Democrats' calls to defund the police and end qualified immunity um, have affected morale. I, I want to know how this would affect their ability to do their job, because that's what we're talking about, is having police on, um, you know, on the streets doing their job, protecting all of society. And, um, you know, first with defunding the police and second with removing uh, qualified immunity. Thank you, Representative. Um, and, and again, I don't want to, um, you know, as a witness, talk about one party versus the other party's policies. On this particular issue, though, to, an to answer your question, um, you know, police officers, just like anybody else, they're, they're men and women that we grew up with, went to school with them, they live in our neighborhoods. Um, it affects them, it affects their morale, just as any other profession would be affected by the constant attacks um, that somehow police are not to be trusted, are violent, uh, are brutal, are racist, and this and that, by using individual cases out of approximately a million officers in the United States to say that, well, that's how they all are, that's how they act, they can't be trusted, they're brutal, they're racist. We wouldn't tolerate that type of broad brush attack on any other class of citizens, but it becomes acceptable for police. And the effect of that on morale is very detrimental. And the effect of that 
is bad for public safety. Because like any other profession, whether it's your auto mechanic, whether it's your pharmacist, whether it's a journalist, if morale is low in the workplace, performance suffers. And unfortunately, in this case, when performance suffers, it's the public that pays the price in terms of public safety. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And, and not only are they, are they uh, people we went to high school with, but in my case, I have several in my family and, and former law enforcement officers that, uh, so I, I, they are in our family too, and they are part of our family. And, but I appreciate your insight on that. And it seems to me that now is not the time to be talking about removing qualified immunity. Law enforcement is under attack, like you mentioned, in cities all around America, and members of this subcommittee are, are, have called for defunding the police and, um, and members of Congress. Uh, meanwhile, crime is on the rise, and uh, we may see crime continue to rise. Uh, but So now is the time to be standing behind law enforcement and supporting them from attacks on their morale and their ability to perform their job. And uh, just a, as kind of a follow-up, Mr. Johnson, um, you know, Democrats believe that officers who can demonstrate in a court of law that they are acting in good faith should still be at risk of facing frivolous personal lawsuits. What kind of effect uh, will this have on the officer's willingness to intervene during a crime in progress? You know, doesn't, uh, doesn't ending qualified immunity punish officers who are willing to rush into volatile situations in an attempt to save lives and prevent further injury? Yes, yes, Representative Fishbach, it does. It creates a disincentive for officers to act because what we're talking about in the qualified immunity context, by definition, we're talking about situations where an unknown constitutional right, in fact, unknowable constitutional right, may cause personal liability to an individual officer. And because by definition it was unknown and unknowable, then trying to address that cannot, by definition, uh, deter other misconduct or uh, improve police policing because officers don't know what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, in terms of this. And, and, and in addressing you know, some of the, the legal arguments about, well, this lawsuit or this class of lawsuits and so forth, I, I get it and I understand the argument in terms of um, large groups of lawsuits when you look at them as a whole. But when you talk about an individual officer and his or her mindset they don't think about, well, it's unlikely that out of this class, I'm the unlucky person who gets personally held liable. The situation that um, it comes about in, in rank and file mind is that I might be liable. And um, it, therefore it's a disincentive, like, you know what, it's safer uh, for my career, for my family, my financial health, uh, maybe just not to take action in this case. And I think that's a situation that, that none of us want on, on any side of the aisle. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And I, I just want to say, you know, this this hearing, we know the reason. This is just another chance for Democrats to try to vilify a profession which is built on selflessness and service. And Democrats want more drugs in the community. That's why we are going to the floor to deal with the, uh, the uh, marijuana bill today. And they want to bail out violent criminals. And now they want criminals to be allowed to sue law enforcement officers. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fishbach, my friend and colleague. And I'd share with you the, the difficulty I have in hearing from less than two percent, one, less than two percent of our caucus that's for defunding the police. But in defense of those members that want to say they defund the police, none of them have invited any of us to orgies, and none of us have been, none of them have invited people to snort cocaine. I now recognize Mr. Hank Johnson. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for their testimony today. Uh, Mr. Johnson, in your testimony, you stated that a functioning, you stated, quote, that a functioning society requires that reasonable officers be provided this qualified immunity in applicable civil cases. Without it, the orderly administration of justice would come to a halt amidst paralyzing fear of personal liability. Am I right? Yes, sir. That's in my testimony, Representative Johnson. And uh, now you heard Judge Newman, uh, who testified that, and by the way, Judge Newman spent 42 years on the U.S. Court of Appeals. And as a federal district court judge, he presided at the trial of more than 30 police misconduct cases. And you recall, he, he testified that 
contracts between cities and police unions provide that the city indemnify police officers found liable in lawsuits under Section 1983. And Judge Newman also testified that it was his experience that jurors in police misconduct cases don't know that the municipality would pay the judgment against the police officer and they would frequently find the officer not liable just to avoid what they thought would be the imposition of liability uh, on the officer. In other words, the officer would have to pay the judgment themselves. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, do you, you don't disagree with Judge Newman uh, on that point, do you? No, Representative Johnson, I certainly don't disagree with his observations uh, as a well, sitting judge and an appellate judge. Um, well, my, let me ask you this. My, my experience comes from a different you. part of the criminal justice system, though. Let, well, we're not talking about criminal justice system. We're talking about our civil justice system and its ability to do justice by way of persons who would be aggrieved by police misconduct. And I know, Mr. Johnson, that you would agree that there are some instances of uh, police misconduct, unnecessary use of, of force, those kinds of things are, do happen, isn't that correct? Of course they do, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, and Judge Newman recommends that Congress create a law that mandates that the city would be liable to pay any judgment rendered against a police officer for misconduct, and that qualified immunity could remain a defense available to the police officer. Uh, Mr. Johnson, what is wrong with uh, Judge Newman's proposed solution? Representative Johnson, I, I would uh, direct the uh, subcommittee to the submitted written testimony of the National Sheriff's Association, for example, for the concerns that employers have. Uh, regarding that, I think that that. Well, I mean, I mean, we're talking Congress. about we're talking about putting it on the employer to have to pay any judgment rendered against their employee. What about that solution? Do you disagree with? I guess what I and I don't want to step out of my lane talking for the sheriffs and the chiefs, but well, so, well, I mean, I, asked, I, 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 this this question. doesn't this doesn't really require. Um, much analysis. It's a it's a very common sense solution to a real problem. Citizens have been stopped from holding rogue police officers accountable when they commit misconduct, and um, and and the denial of justice in those kinds of circumstances due to this doctrine of qualified immunity is an injustice and we're just simply talking about how to how to render an injustice uh something that um that does not continually happen in these cases in america so what what criticism would you have on congress passing a law that imposed liability on governments for the actions of their employees. Thank you, Representative Johnson. I, I understand the argument. I guess my, my concern on that would be that when we're talking about liability itself, whether it's on the individual officer or on the employing agency, our view of qualified immunity, immunity in general in this context, whether it's for the officer or the employing agency is that in fairness and in justice, it ought not be imposed if we're talking about a liability predicated upon the violation of a constitutional right when that right was not yet known at the well, time. Yeah, that the well, I mean, you could still have the doctrine of qualified immunity in place, but you would simply have a situation where juries would know that if they found a police officer liable, then that police officer would not be personally liable. It would be the city that would pay the judgment. What's wrong with that? If you can quickly I, respond, I we're, we're over, over time, but if you quickly respond to the, I'd appreciate it. Yes, Chairman. I think, I think the problem with that writ large is that the same reason that we don't want jurors to know, um, hey, if, if this person's liable, someone else is gonna pay the bill, 
because it tends to engender greater verdicts and that than we would otherwise have based simply on the evidence. So you just the simply evidence. don't want to have police Tom, officers Tom, held liable. Period. I've, I've got a call. Time. Time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize Mr. Roy. I thank the chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I'd like to note uh, that I'm glad that my friend from Maryland, who I don't see on the screen anymore, is committed to attacking judicial activism as much as, as I like to do, uh, and is now quoting my constitutionalist friend and Fifth Circuit uh, Judge Don Willett, uh, whose daughter is a classmate of my son's in school in Austin, Texas. He's a good friend. But notably not being cited right now by my Democratic colleagues is my friend and great American devoted to the Constitution, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, who said in his concurrence in Ziegler, quote, I write separately to note my growing concern with our qualified immunity jurisprudence. Until we shift the focus of our inquiry to whether immunity existed at common law, we will continue to substitute our own policy preferences for the mandates of Congress. In an appropriate case, we should reconsider our qualified immunity jurisprudence. Well, I'm glad we're all agreeing with Clarence Thomas today. Um, the problem is that, uh, as my friend from California, Mr. McClintock suggested, is that my Democratic colleagues are one, targeting almost entirely and solely uh, police officers, and that that is entirely political, and two, intertwining that attack with a coordinated defunding effort, notwithstanding my friend from Maryland's uh, characterization to the contrary. Failing to acknowledge, for example, uh, the $150 million cut in Austin, Texas, the 22 million in Baltimore, Maryland, the 16 million in Boston, Massachusetts, the 1 million in Burlington, Vermont, the 10 million in Denver, Colorado, 2 million in Hartford, Connecticut, Kansas City, 42 million, LA, 150 million. Of course, notably, most of these jurisdictions the following year refunded those cuts because they saw the foolishness of the knee-jerk reaction that destroyed and devastated our police officers and ability to do their jobs across the country. But Austin puts money back in their budget, and guess what? The police academies are completely destroyed. And now you gotta go back and try to figure out how to recruit. And now you don't have people being able to answer 911 calls. Now, my Democratic colleagues want to talk about qualified immunity. But then they say, oh, you voted against $350 billion of funding. They don't tell you that that was in a $1.9 trillion monstrosity filled with all sorts of other socialist big government garbage. They don't tell you that the $350 billion has language in there saying that it's about community investing. Not just money for cops to be able to go do their job, but community investing. And I heard the chairman of the Judiciary Committee talk about, oh, I was fine with moving money from the cops to some other department. Well, of course, if you can take that money and take it away from cops and go dump it into some social engineering program in New York, uh, New York City. But that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Instead of being able to sit here and say, let's actually have a discussion about qualified immunity. Last summer, my colleagues forced a vote and didn't give us the chance to amend on the floor or have a debate on actual qualified immunity instead of just gutting it, targeting cops. I actually think we're having a, a productive conversation here with respect to what Judge Newman has, has produced and put forward, and I think my friend from California said positive things about, and I think that Mr. Schweiker from Cato has said. So I would just like to kind of throw out there my last two minutes, um, and I'd like to throw a question uh, to Judge Newman. Do, do, do you believe, sir, uh, Judge Newman, that if you were to go down the road you suggested, that that would, you're talking about applying that across the board, not just to police departments, right? That, that would try to address the qualified immunity problem for government officials of all uh, stripes. Yes, just like 1983 says, whenever uh, somebody acting under color of law violates, uh, it denies the constitutional rights of a person, any person under color of law. It could be a jailer. It's certainly not limited to police officers. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And then if, if I might add, direct a question to Mr. Uh, Mr. Manguel and to Mr. Johnson, uh, would, how would you all, how would you gentlemen view the possibility of going down the road of what Judge Newman puts out there, that we have liability for uh, the cities, for the departments, et cetera, as opposed to targeting the individuals and then let that get sorted out between the individuals and the, and the cities, the, the sovereigns, if you will? I, I certainly think that's a proposal that's worth worthy of, of close consideration. And I would note that, that it mirrors exactly what happens right now. As I said earlier in my testimony, 99.98% of all dollars recovered against individual police officers are actually paid by the governmental entity that employs them. That's already the case. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I do think it's it's certainly worth considering. What, what I would add to that, though, is is addressing the problem of, of saucier and, and its reversal. I, I think allowing courts to continually punt constitutional questions leaves uh, the law underdeveloped in the civil rights arena and, and 
reinstituting that proper sequence, I think, will go a long way. Well, thank you. I got 15 seconds left. I think Mr. Johnson answered Mr. McClintock's question on that. I would just note that this idea of making sure this applies beyond police officers is critically important. Uh, I'll point out a case in Colorado Springs where a, a caseworker for the El Paso County Department of Human Services uh, received permission from her supervisor to inspect a four-year-old girl's buttocks, stomach, and back for signs of physical abuse, did so, took pictures without approval from the parents. The parents had no recourse. We need to address this across the board. Mr. Chairman, I, over my time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Roy. And I'd like to uh, make a little uh, mea culpa, I guess. I've been kind of teasing you all a little bit about the sex orgies and the cocaine. I've just recently learned that Mr. McCarthy had a closed-door hearing with uh, Mr. Cawthorn, and he apparently told Mr. McCarthy that what he said was untrue. Now, Roger Stone says that's not true, that Mr. Cawthorn still backs it up, but I'll take Mr. McCarthy's statement. Uh, Ms. Ross, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you to all the witnesses for testifying. And I'm thrilled that I went after Mr. Roy because we agree completely on this. Um, the problem of qualified immunity goes well beyond the police. As a former civil rights litigator, I actually rarely sued the police. I sued lots of other people, and they invoked qualified immunity. And so we, sh we should be addressing this problem writ large. Many examples in the public mind right now involve the police, and we shouldn't exempt them from any change in qualified immunity. But we have had egregious situations in North Carolina with the Department of Social Services. We've seen egregious situations with sexual misconduct and treatment of women. We've seen egregious situations with racial discrimination and discrimination against immigrants. And all of those issues should be on the table today. Um, as we know, the doctrine of qualified immunity uh, protects state and local officials, not just the police, where they can only be held liable for violating somebody's rights if a court has previously ruled that the actions are unconstitutional the actions, and therein lies the problem. If no decision exists, the official can be immune from liability even if they intentionally violate the Constitution. Qualified immunity acts like a time warp. In its current form, the doctrine allows conduct to be judged by completely outdated standards. And parts of our history that we are trying to rectify. It doesn't let us rectify history. Public officials should not be allowed to avoid the consequences for egregious actions by hiding behind judicial opinions that previously found conduct acceptable. The actions of law enforcement and other public officials must be judged under evolving standards of what constitutes constitutional conduct not decades or centuries old endorsing of unconsci unconscionable practices. My first question is for Mr. Schweikert. In your written testimony, you cite several cases in which qualified immunity was granted because the cases differed just slightly from clearly established precedent. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through a couple of them, but my question is, how has the clearly established law test stunted the development of constitutional law? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's, it has stunted the development of constitutional law because the Supreme Court has held, um, as Mr. Mengel has previously discussed, that courts are allowed to dismiss a case by saying, well, we're not even going to decide whether this was constitutional or not. We're just saying it's not clearly established, so qualified immunity case dismissed, which means the law then does not become clearly established going forward. And so this is why Judge Don Willett has called qualified immunity a catch-22. Um, and it means that, in fact, the exact same misconduct could be committed the very next day, and again and again and again, it could still be excused based on qualified immunity because courts refuse to decide the constitutional question, especially in the most difficult cases where clarification of the law is most needed. Thank you very much. And Mr. Ago, um, we got a great example from um, Mr. Roy earlier of 
local um, officials who violated constitutional rights but were granted co uh, qualified immunity not in the law enforcement context. Uh, could you share with us other examples outside of the law enforcement context? Uh, thank, thank you, Congresswoman Ross. Uh, um, the Lawyers Committee is concerned about law enforcement because of the devastating and differential impact of police abuse and misconduct against communities of color. That said, there are substantial numbers of examples outside of the law enforcement con uh, context where, for example, public schools, school teachers abuse their power. Um, um, it, situations like uh, what you mentioned, Congresswoman Ross, social workers abuse their power and violate the constitutional rights of the people that they're supposed to be serving. So that there are lots of con um, examples outside of law enforcement. The, law, um, the uh, Lawyers Committee's concern is law enforcement, though. And um, to our distinguished judge with my last 16 minutes, if we, uh, 16 seconds, I'm sorry. I wish I had 16 minutes. Um, would your solution deal with this broad problem um, much more effectively? Yeah, the answer is yes. I think it would make it an effective remedy and I think it would make it a modification that has some chances of being enacted. And from the controversy I've heard today, I despair uh, that as what happened 30 years ago when I testified to you, nothing happened. So I think you ought to consider a municipal liability, employer liability generally, in order to get something done about this problem. Thank you, and I yield back. I am going to yield the chair to Congressman Ross so she can have the opportunity to introduce and recognize her distinguished colleague. Um, Ms. Garcia, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this very important hearing. There seems to be some, some confusion as to why we're even here, and it's um, been uh, really hard to sit here and listen uh, to some of the comments that are made from the other side of the aisle about the reason for this hearing and what Democrats do or don't believe, and even a witness referred to the policies of the, the parties, you know, this is not a, a discussion of a policy of any party, but it is, in fact, a very serious discussion about law and, and law that was made by a court and, and what we need to do to make some reforms, because the f reforms are needed. Uh, and to hear my colleagues talk about the defunding police and how Democrats are doing nothing but really focused in a coordinated effort to do this. I mean, that is just nonsense. All they need to do is to read the president's proposed budget. And the president himself has said that we need to invest more money in funding effective, accountable community policing, not less. And his budget reflects that, including by more than doubling cops hiring programs. 300 new deputy marshals, 20.6 billion in discretionary funding for federal law enforcement and state and local enforcement, crime prevention programs, 537 million to put more police officers, more police officers on the beat for accountability community policing. And that's the key word. It's about behavior. It's about accountability. And I'm glad that Ms. Ross, uh, mentioned that this is not just a discussion about police. We know there are good police officers, and we also know there's good public officials. However, just like every creative of an, uh, crate of apples, the old saying says there's always one bad apple in the crate. And then fortunately, I think that's what we're focused on today. So public officials, not only law enforcement, abuse their power and sometimes weaponize it against our most vulnerable communities. We cannot turn a willful blind eye to that fact. Revising the Qualified Immunity Doctrine is a step in the right direction. The Qualified Immunity Doctrine in practice ends up being absolute immunity and effectively deprives victims of their day in court. And Ms. Wright, I want to start, talk to, uh, start with you. You mentioned the Taylor case, which in no way can be justified if uh, those officers or those I guess jail uh, attendants were acting in good faith. That is, that is a, a, a defense. But, but when we talk about qualified immunity, it really isn't just about those officers. 
uh, because in fact, those officers don't really pay the judgments. Is that correct? That's correct, Congresswoman. In my experience, in almost all cases, it is not the officers on the line for the financial responsibility. It's their employers or the state or municipality. Well, because this proposal to change to an employer's liability, it really is their employers who end up writing the check because of the rules of, of, of um, indemnity. And I know that there's some municipal governments throughout this country who, frankly, some have had to raise taxes to pay, to pay judgments. Some have had to flow judgment bonds to pay, pay those uh, 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 settlements. So what is that doing to local governments and their ability to, to really focus on putting the police on the street, putting the crime prevention programs forward, and making sure that they keep the community safe? What we have seen in municipalities and jurisdictions where they have had to pay these large settlements is that what often follows is an direction to police officers to not violate the Constitution in that specific way. And so it is a way of actually, because the citizens, taxpayers are ultimately really the ones who suffer because it's their money that pays the judgment, there is pressure by the employer, by the municipality, to make sure that the officers are not doing the same thing again because that will result in a political price. And so I think that that proposal and municipal um, municipalities being responsible actually increases accountability and officers acting within the law. So, Mr. Sparker, could you give us examples where the defense of a good faith uh, uh, did work? I mean, that it was upheld in court, and the officer was 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 absolved of any accountability and, and liability. Sure. I mean, I, I uh, thank you for the question. I mean, I, the only thing I would clarify is that qualified immunity that exists today is not a good faith standard. It has nothing to do with whether officers were acting in good faith. And in fact, many uh, cases, officers are explicitly acting in bad faith, and they still receive qualified immunity. Um, I mean, I, I met two, two examples that I mentioned were the Jessup case, where officers were alleged to have stolen money for their own personal enrichment. They received right. qualified immunity. Um, the Frazier case, where officers were... Uh, and I think this does relate to a point that Mr. Johnson has repeatedly said that this only applies in unknowable case, you know, constitutional violations, and that's simply untrue. The officers in the Fraser Mr. case. Mr. Schweiker, could you wrap up? We're yes. running over. Of course, time. the officers in Fraser were explicitly trained on this man's First Amendment rights, and they violated it knowingly, and they still received qualified immunity. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm hopeful that my colleagues across the aisle will vote for the president's budget with all that money. In all those investments to reduce crime and help our police officers. Thank you. Noted. Um, Mr. Owens, you are recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, like other states in America, Utah is an incredible law enforcement community. Uh, these men and women are heroes. The vast majority of them are good, honest officers who risk their lives every day to keep our community safe. Uh, and with that, uh, for what I've heard today again from my from my officers is eliminating the qualified immunity would impede the abilities of police officers to do their job. My friends at the National Fraternal Order of Police have said the following, and I quote, every single factual scenario a police officer encounters is different than I know. It is almost impossible for an officer to determine how a legal document will apply to a split second factual scenario. Thus, the reasonable officer needs to be afforded a certain degree of discretion to make second, uh, split second decisions in situations that could risk lives, including their own, uh, put them at risk. Qualified immunity does not protect officers who normally violate the law, nor does it affect criminal proceedings or, international, or internal investigations. This doctrine is, is vital to law enforcement officers, officers who need this protection to perform their discretionary functions fundamental to their law enforcement and public surf, uh, safety mission. The FOP will not yield the, in our efforts to preserve the existing qualified immunity doctrine. And, and I end quote with that. Uh, uh, Mr. Miguel, uh, does your research show that there's a significant number of claims against law enforcement officers are denied because of qualified immunity? Uh, it does not. So far as I'm aware, the data are very clear in showing that qualified immunity accounts for a very, very small slice of police litigation outcomes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Johnson, I've heard from my local law enforcement officers, officers, especially those in the rural area, and they're having trouble recruiting good candidates because of a number of factors, including a toxic funding police movement we've all had to deal with the last couple of years, the broad brush and meeting of an honorable profession, and now inflation. 
Uh, in your opinion, was stripping law enforcement officers of qualified immunity hurt recruitment efforts, especially specifically in the rural areas? Yes, Representative Owens, it would. And the reason I say that is because uh, there's so many uh, hurdles that a man or woman has to go through to become a police officer in the first place. Education, background checks, lie detector tests, drug tests, psychological evaluations, training, and so on. The men and women that we recruit, and rightfully so, are well qualified for these positions. But by definition, they're also then well qualified to do other things too. So if this law enforcement profession becomes even more difficult and dangerous than it already is, and um, the men and women are, are demonized unfairly for trying to do a good job, then we can only expect that recruitment and retention are gonna go down. And that's exactly what we're seeing in rural departments and in large agencies across the United States. Thank you. And then Madam Chair, I yield back my time. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Bush, you are recognized. Thank you, I send my thank you for convening this hearing. Um, in America, the legal shield and court-made doctrine of qualified immunity has allowed police officers to kill black people with impunity. When a police officer shot a 10-year-old child in Georgia, the 11th, the 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals held that the officer was entitled to qualified immunity. When police officers tased an unarmed pregnant woman in Seattle, a court found that the officer was entitled to qualified immunity. When officers set a man on fire, the Fifth Circuit held that officers involved were entitled to qualified immunity. All of this is happening as our country is reckoning with the reality of record-breaking police killings. There were only 15, one five, 15 days last year in which police officers didn't kill someone. 2021 broke the record for police killings in this country, 1,055 deaths by law enforcement, and that is likely an undercount. St. Louis continues to lead the country year after year in police killings per capita. In a country that is governed by the so-called rule of law, you have to ask yourself, are police officers above the law? Does the constitution not apply to black people? Mr. Ago, I believe that true justice is saving lives. Can you please explain why achieving true justice demands that we reconsider the doctrine of qualified immunity? Uh, thank you for your question, yeah. Congresswoman Bush. Um, the, the problem with police misconduct and police violence is that it is meted out against um, communities of color in a devastating and differential way. And, and, that is, and, and those are facts that, um, that we cannot get around. The way, by eliminating qualified immunity, what you do is you start to bring accountability for those situations where police um, violate the civil rights uh, predominantly and disproportionately borne um, by people of color. And what that creates is a cycle of trust and safety and better policing. Because accountability breeds trust in the system by people who see that officers who violate the civil rights of people, uh, predominantly people of color, um, um, when we're talking about the statistics, then when those officers are held accountable, the other members of the community begin to trust that the system works for them and that they begin to then um, trust policing. It, it is a cycle of that, that benefits communities of color. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Ago. Qualified immunity signals to law enforcement that they can get away with unconstitutional conduct. It is why I'm happy to support Representative Presley's Ending Qualified Immunity Act. And it's why I believe that any comprehensive police reform must include ending qualified immunity. Professor Reiner, in the aftermath of the Civil War, the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist vigilantes violently attacked Black people and infiltrated law enforcement departments across this country, prompting the need for legal protections. Can you talk about the history of qualified immunity and the way in which it is deeply tied to our country's history of enslavement and white supremacy? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you for the question. And I think the first part of it goes to the premise of your question, which is that the point of the 1871 Civil Rights Act was both to provide a remedy for newly created rights, 
and also to take ex enforcement of that remedy away from states because of the mistrust that states would actually enforce the Constitution against their own officers. Then we fast forward to the courts, the Supreme Court's creation of the doctrine in 1967 was in the context of an arresting of people who were protesting desegregation. It was part of the Freedom Riders. And that's where the court first recognized this good faith immunity. And it was a complete, it's a, it's a way to undermine all of the goals that the Reconstruction Congress was trying to achieve when it enacted the 1871 Civil Rights Act. And when the court uh, altered the immunity doctrine in 1982 to make it even more protective of police officers and also added all sorts of procedural protections along the way, as my written testimony details, it takes us even farther from enforcing the vision of the Reconstruction Congress, which was to truly enforce these transformative rights uh, after the Civil War. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as lawmakers, we must be dedicated to saving lives, especially Black lives. In order to do that, we must confront and acknowledge the forces of white supremacy that we are up against. The truth is that less than 2% of police officers have been charged with a crime for police killing as a result of qualified immunity. So true justice and true accountability means ending this legal shield. Thank you. And the truth you just heard, I yield back. Um, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you so very much. It leaves me to at least a moment of concluding uh, the essence of this hearing and to make a proclamation or pronouncement that we can deal with qualified immunity and we can save lives. Uh, let me um, indicate uh, for the framing of this that both the Sixth and Seventh Amendment are seemingly violated with qualified immu immunity. Uh, and in simple layman terms, what qualified immunity's existence does is it stops everyone at the courthouse door. Because what happens is, is the court says, you have no case because there's qualified immunity. You don't even get to the fact circumstance uh, before cases are dismissed. Evidenced the Robin, uh, Robbie Tolan case that went up to the United States Supreme Court on the basis of a federal district court dismissing a police case, officer out of Bel Air, Texas, before facts could even be heard. So even out of fairness, qualified immunity must be subject to modification because you close the courthouse door. Let me ask uh, these questions. And as I do so, I raise these questions in the name of good law enforcement captain across America. I raise these questions in the name of Danny Ray Thomas, Robbie Tolan, Nicholas Chavez, George Floyd, Pam Turner, Breonna Taylor, Deontay Wright, Eric Garner, and many others. So let me just uh, say to you, have you seen uh, a massive um, movement of police officers, good police officers, uh, not uh, rising to the occasion because of false rumors uh, about uh, local jurisdictions not wanting police officers? Captain? No, ma'am, Congressman, woman. We ha I haven't seen that. And Most with the issue of qualified immunity, and I thank you very much, we should note Noble has officers in all categories. You have officers leading major chiefs as well that are members of your organization. Um, in the instance of qualified immunity, is my simple definition uh, one that you can accept, which means qualified immunity keeps uh, the uh, offended persons from even getting into the courthouse to get facts, to, to get the facts of what happened? Yes, yes ma'am. That is true. And is it not uh, wrong to keep people out of the courthouse so that facts can be uh, portrayed, whether it's the offending police officer or the person who feels, or the family who's lost a loved one? No, man, I feel that everybody needs justice. But the qualified minute must be preserved and reformed. Everybody needs justice, so it should be heard in the courthouse. Thank you. Judge Newman, can we uh, articulate your um, offering of the municipality can be sued, but you are not precluding the officer from being a defendant as well. No, I'm not precluding it, but I'm saying the suit against the municipality would be much more successful because the municipality does not have the defense of qualified immunity. And the monetary capacity you're suggesting would be uh, in the realm of the municipality. Is that what you're saying? That That's correct. It's been pointed out they now indemnify but you have to be careful here. 
indemnifying means paying a claim, a judgment already entered against the employee. So if there's no judgment against the employee, there's no indemnity. If the suit is directly against the employer uh, and the employer has no qualified immunity, that's clear. It's a much more successful remedy than a suit against the officer. And what I would say, Judge, is that I think this should be one of the frameworks, I mean, not the only one, that we look at in terms of dealing with qualified immunity. My point is you blocked at the courthouse door if you use qualified immunity as saying there's no reason to even hold a trial. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, that certainly happens sometimes. Uh, but there are many cases where, and that, in other words, if the case is dismissed as a matter of law at summary judgment because the facts are undisputed. But there are many cases where the facts are disputed, where it doesn't go off on summary judgment. It goes to trial. As I indicated, I tried 30 of these many years ago, and they very often end up with a, a verdict for the uh, police officer or thank, the public thank, employee. Thank you. The facts in the Robbie Tolan case was the judge dismissed it on, as I understand it, summary judgment, just on the fact that qualified immunity existed and gave that uh, permissiveness, that protection to the officer. Let me quickly go to Ms. Wright, and I want to thank Mr. Reinard and Mr. Swikert for articulating uh, the qualified immunity uh, lack of being able to have case law. But let me um, indicate to Ms. Wright, again, uh, what a heinous set of circumstances as it relates to your uh, client. Um, can you tell me the heinousness of the victimization of uh, defendants or incarcerated persons when there is qualified immunity? And Ms. Wright, briefly, I know this is a serious matter, but... Um, and I have some in issues to put into the record. I, think. I yield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, I will say I've described what happened to Mr. Taylor, but the people who are imprisoned are among the weakest in our community because they rely on the state for everything. Just now, before the Supreme Court, is a case where guards knew a person was suicidal, put them in a cell with a 30-foot cord, and watched him commit suicide without intervening or calling for help. Those guards got qualified immunity. And so it is something that happens often within the prison context. Let me thank the uh, chair for um, her indulgence and as well all of the witnesses. I'd like to put into the record a Washington Post article, March 29, 2022. Black Americans are killed at a much higher rate than white Americans. Although half of the people that are shot and killed by police are white, black Americans are shot at a disproportionate rate. And this article will uh, relay that. And then a full list. Uh, and then a full list of uh, black people killed by police in 2021, uh, and that is a Newsweek article on 12-28. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back by saying this committee and the Judiciary Committee can find solutions to this, uh, and the witnesses have given us a roadmap of which we can follow. And I thank you so very much, and I yield back. Without objection. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, I also have a unanimous consent. I wanted to enter into the record a list that our committee put together of Democrat-led cities that have defunded the police with a total of $1.66 billion cut. Just enter that. Without objection. And, and what, just one point of personal privilege. Mr. Raskin mentioned, I think when I was out of the room, um, that uh, my statements about Democrats wanting to defund the police was inaccurate in some way. So I was encouraged to hear him express his support suddenly uh, on behalf of Democrats for funding the police. We certainly welcome that. Uh, but the Democrats' $1.9 trillion partisan spending legislation does not specifically direct funding of local law enforcement agencies. I have urged the Biden administration myself, Madam Chair, to correct that error in the rulemaking process by specifically directing a portion of that funding to local police departments, but I have gotten zero response. Would my good friend no, yield? No, Would no, my good friend yield? Well, um, I, I'm we're, almost, we're I have one. We're going to conclude today's hearing. The ranking hearing. member has the privilege of making a person, because the chair does all the time, and Ms. Jackson went over a minute. I'm finished with one statement. I want to invite Mr. Raskin uh, to join me in signing on that effort to the White House, and I will send him the correspondence today. Yield would back. the gentleman yield? Yes, ma'am. If I might, Madam Chair, if he would yield. Um, there are a lot of stereotypes that are going around. I respect individual positions of members, Republicans, and Democrats. And I assume you do not associate uh, with your Republican friends uh, that consider January 6th uh, just a group of tourists. Uh, then uh, we may have a big tent. You might have a big tent. But I think you need to look at the facts by piercing those statistics that you have, suggesting um, broad definitions. We have the right to have people with differing opinions, uh, but I can assure you 
there are enough relatives of police officers in and among Democratic members of Congress that we are also uh, respecters of the law. I yield back. Well, I, I, I respect you, of course, my colleague, and I, and I uh, acknowledge that, but I will tell you that it has been a position of members on this committee, whom I quoted earlier, who have wanted to defund the police. That's a fact. Yield back. Okay. Thank you very much for, the, for this conclusion. I do want to note that Mr. Roy and I are in complete agreement about how to solve this problem, and I hope that that and our judge's suggestion will help uh, provide a roadmap going forward. This concludes today's hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. The hearing is adjourned.